Welcome to the Fan Podcast. Today, and we are kicking off a two-part episode on short-term missions. My co-host Derek Schuessler is with us, the FAM's Director of Mobilization, and it couldn't be more appropriate, your role in your title and your experience with FAM, for us to be kicking off this series on short-term missions. Yeah. Derek, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about this particular topic because this is what I do here. Yeah, that's uh, right. So it's it's going to be a good, good discussion. You bet. And your experience is you were on... FAM's very first short-term mission trip. You yeah. were on it. Not only on it, you were leading it back in our old stomping ground. So, man, between the two of us, there's no one more experienced or qualified within FAM to be talking about how FAM does short-term missions. So, man, I'm excited about getting into it in this episode and the episode to come. So, right now, we're going to be breaking down how does FAM do short-term missions? What are our philosophies? What's our, our doctrines that are established around it? Our values and principles that are derived for the who, the where, the why, the when, the what of how we do short-term missions. And, you know, I, I love the way we do it. And we're going to get into it a lot. But um, when I think about our short-term missions, it's something that I'm proud of. Yeah. And I think everybody on our team that recruits and then mobilizes and does all the logistics to our guys on the field that receive those teams and put them to work, they're like, man, this is a worthy and valiant effort of what we're doing to seek to advance the kingdom through short-term missions. Well, with that said, let's get right into it with this part of the series, How FAM Does Short-Term Missions. And I got a question for you, Derek. You know, there are several ways of doing missions and different organizations, different people pursue it in a lot of different ways. Uh, but can you break down and describe something in the missions world for us about the difference between the three ways that we send people to go on mission? Yeah. Yeah. So there, I mean, we're, we're talking about short-term mission. So yeah. that kind of that term begs the question, there are other terms of mission. So the way that we send people with a short term is is going to be that more intense trip, yeah. that, that shorter time frame, uh, whether that's a week or up to you know a month, that, that yeah. type of term limit on your, your trip. And it's going to be intensive. You're going to take – you're going to have a return trip in mind, yeah, right? right? And so um, – when you when you think about that, the commitment level is is going. I can do anything for a week. <laughs> yeah, you know that's like. that's a big difference between the short term and some of these longer, whether that's intermediate or long term, is the the commitment, the mindset that goes into it. About how many of those kind of trips do we send a year? Yeah, so we have twelve trips uh, this year, and okay. it, it usually averages about twelve to fifteen trips. Uh, as we expand more areas, I think those trips sure. are going to increase. But right now we have. All of the 12 for this year are pretty much full. Oh, we have great. a few spots left. But yeah. We have a lot of people going on that short term limit, week or two, getting out there. They know when they're leaving. They know when they're coming back and what's expected of them. Yep. And then, then you get into more of the intermediate term, and that's going to be you know a longer longer time in the field, whether that's mm. here in Houston, like our internship for, for the summer months, yeah. or uh, with the residency program. That's a two-year term limit or a two-year training program that we have here. Yeah. That then is going to be deployed uh, for a long term commitment. Okay. So we're going after our long term career missionaries, if you will, that they're yeah. going and they don't have a really return in mind. They okay. don't have a return ticket purchased. Yeah. So intermediate term would be from a, you know, a month or so to about six months to even uh, two years. Yeah. Anything that would have term to it above a week or two would mm -hmm. be our intermediate term. Yep. And then long-term is anything that doesn't have a term. Yep. If you're on a one-way ticket, you're a long-term missionary <laughs> with us. Yeah, I got it. Okay, good. I like those distinctives. You know, it seems like when we're talking about short-term missions particularly, that they really invoke a strong emotion in people. I mean, everybody I've met, when the conversation comes about short-term missions, sometimes you have that person that's like, I would never do that. I don't want my kids doing it. I would never do it. I, I don't even have a passport. Yeah, you, right? need, you usually know how they feel pretty much immediately yeah. by their face. Strong emotions yeah. come out. And then there's the, you know, the other side of that strong emotions, just as strong. And she's like, man, I go on two or three trips a year. I love it. I go to the same place. The people over there are my best friend. I got my clothes I take with me. I got my traveling bag and my boots and I'm ready to go. And if you don't go, there's something wrong with you. Everybody needs to go. Yeah. There's that guy or lady. <laughs> and then uh, we love those. We have a lot of those with fam. We love them. They're Absolutely. precious to us. And then there's that other side of it. It's a total antithesis that's mm -hmm. 
you know, wait, wait a second, wait a second. When we think about pursuing the Great Commission, I don't even know if this is biblical in the way we're going about it or designing it. And if, if it's a tool that should even be employed mm. as we seek to fulfill the Great Commission throughout the world. Uh, So you have a lot of these emotions. And man, from your role with FAM and your experiences in life, why do you think that short-term missions bring out such strong emotion with people? Yeah, I think it gets down to just the challenging nature of the of the trips. Yeah, they're uh, challenging they no are, matter what. Yeah. In, a, in a lot of ways, whether that's just the time to get there. Because our trips are – it's a, it's a long way. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take just a day to get there. Um, so the, the time, you got to take off work, you got to yeah. travel, that kind of thing. That's a that's a challenge for a lot of people. And they're like, it's, it's not worth it to go that far and only do a week's worth sure. of ministry. Um, so that's a challenge for, for some people. But I think more than just the time is the challenge to – your comfort zone, mm-hmm. whether that's something that you love, you want to get out of your comfort zone, or it's a challenge to those who they, they, they don't want to get out of their view of church or their yeah. their expectations for what this should look like. They don't they don't want to get out of that comfort mm-hmm. zone. So that's going to conjure up some emotions too. Yeah. So you're saying the challenge of it all, the challenge to your philosophy, the challenge to your doctrine, the challenge to your comfort zone, the challenge to your wallet, the challenging nature of what needs to happen just to get there, yep. just just to be willing to go, to actually get there and then try to be productive there, that because of their challenging nature, whether you're mm-hmm. for it or against it, it brings out strong yeah. emotion. I think you've called it a, a Bunsen burner effect before. <laughs> yeah, like really? you, you have this laboratory that's intensive that it's going to put things to the test. It's going to yeah. put things under the fire. Yeah. And that's what they do. That intense nature, it does bring out strong emotion. Yeah. You know, and I look over my 30 years of full-time ministry, I've been on, if not hundreds, you know, close to the 200 mark. Yeah, I've seen on, your passport. That's on full. short-term <laughs> missions. And I've done it on six continents and more than 80 countries around the world. And when I look back over that journey, you know, started my first mission trip when I was 19 as a freshman in college. Um, there's not one short-term experience I've been on where I could say I'm ashamed of it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, man, I'm ashamed. Ain't nothing like that. But to be honest and transparent with our viewers and to really get to it, when I look back over my short-term mission resume, <laughs> there are definitely some um, short-term mission experiences where I'd have to say, well, I'm not ashamed of it now, Derek. I'm not ashamed of it. But uh, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, honest, I'm, a little, I'm just a little embarrassed yeah. of the things that we did. I'm embarrassed of... The way we went about it, I'm a little embarrassed of the the wake we left behind, you know, and uh, the manner in which we pursued it, and even some of the motivations we had in Mm. it. Uh, Yeah, I'm not ashamed. Glad we did it. It had some effect. But there'd be some things that you might change. Yeah, there's some embarrassment about, I wish I would have known then what I know now and would have been in the position to employ that. So some of it I'm a little embarrassed about it. Uh, And I... And I think a lot of people feel the same way I do uh, from what they've experienced in going over. Just like, man, I'm a little embarrassed of the lack of preparation by the organization or the missionaries on the field. I'm a little embarrassed of the tools and tactics we employed, the preparation we had to be effective there, uh, how we were spooled up. And, you know, and I think they've they've got back on the plane or the bus or the car and they've strapped in to go home. And before they rolled out or before they went wheels up, they had that sinking feeling in their stomach like I have had many times in the past. Man, what is actually going to take place and result from what we've done in the time we've had here? Yeah. And I think that that gives a bad taste in people's mouth for something that can be wonderful and tremendous mm this thing we call short-term missions. But I want you to talk to our listeners, and why do you think short-term missions get such a bad rap? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is is similar to what you just described. Uh, It gets a bad rap because for for many years, the way that we as the the church have done mission is – the short-term mission is is just bad. Yeah. It's uh, it's, It's a bad rap because – it's been bad mission. It's been a bad experience, <laughs> yeah. been bad mission, yeah. And we need uh, to own that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think part of it was w- the long-term workers were more mandated, like yeah. kind of you, you have to take these short-term teams um, to fulfill our yeah. development plans, fulfill our <laughs> yeah. uh, 
fundraising, whatever it was, but it's been a distraction for the long-term workers. It's been a uh, kind of a babysitting, yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, you get a bad rap because it's perceived as more of a nuisance yeah. by the field workers than a uh, a benefit, yeah. right? Yeah, I could get you a bad rap because yeah. it gets a bad rap in those that receive and then those that go kind of feel that. Well, we just kind of got in these guys' way. I yeah. don't want to be doing that. Could have yeah. done something better with my time. And anything that's done for just the, the positive experience of the goer, yeah. uh, that's gonna that should get a bad rap too because they're doing it maybe with some selfish desires or selfish ambition. Uh, sure, big time. Uh, not always completely selfish, but there is a a self-focus to <laughs> yeah. to the trip itself. Yeah, self-focused experience. Yeah. Putting a bad taste for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody. You get, you get a bad rap with that, yeah. All right, well, let's answer the big question. I mean, we've, we've looked and seen that short-term missions can be joyous, they can be very impactful. Uh, we see that for some good reasons, they, they put a bad taste in some people's mouth and have kind of got a little bad reputation among some be, because a lot of it was just bad missions. Mm -hmm. And it seems weird to even have to say there's something called bad missions, but anybody who's been active in this world knows bad missions exist. Yeah. We want to not be about bad missions. But whether you've had great experiences in short-term missions or whether you've been you know, left wanting more or deserving more in the short-term mission experiences that you've been on, there's a bigger question that we need to address today, rather than just experience or history or preference. Yeah. And the big question is this, are short-term missions biblical? Do we see examples of them in Scripture that are worthy of emulating and that give us principles on what it would look like to express missions in a short-term experience and be very biblical in that pursuit? And as we seek to answer that big question here at FAM, particularly from the mobilization office and department, when we say, are short-term missions biblical? <laughs> Our answer is yes. Yes, short-term missions are biblical. Yeah, absolutely. We believe that. So, KP, why don't you walk us through some of those? Yeah. You know, one of the my favorite examples to talk about when we're looking at this is Philip's short-term mission down the Gaza Road. Uh, that's recorded in Acts chapter 8. It, mm. It's a great example of a short-term mission. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you think that biblical example helps us as we consider doing short-term mission? Yeah. When we look at what Philip was doing and, and what's recorded there and the principles we can derive from it, it's really showing us a model, mm. a current appropriate model for us to structure short-term missions that we could then perceive to be biblical. Yeah, how right? so? Well, when you look at Philip's story and you start kind of breaking it down as he's preparing to go and all that things, we see a few things. And the first one that's going to help us build a model is that a harvest field was prepared by the Lord. Mm. And the only thing that was lacking was a harvest force to bring it in. So when I'm thinking of how do I create a model for short-term missions as a missions pastor or an agency leader or a field missionary, Okay, a good model for short-term missions, we see a harvest field is prepared. It's been identified, yep. But what we're lacking is a harvest force, okay? So I need to rally that harvest force of short-term mission goers to go in and work those harvest fields. All right? So that's what we see in Philip's story, right? He was a, a field down the Gaza Road with just one man was prepared by the Lord, and he was looking for a harvest force. And he found that harvest forced in Philip. Mm. Another good uh, aspect of creating that model, a biblical model for short-term mission, it was in the ambiguity that Philip found mm. in the details of his missions. You know, a lot of times short-term mission gets a bad rap because they're like, okay, where are we going? What are we doing? I can't even find it on a map. I don't know the people there. I haven't studied the culture. I don't know anything about the language. Uh, can I really make a difference? There's just a, there's just a lot of questions, a lot of fog about what we're going to be doing. And what I love about it is even in this model that we see, Philip's mission was full of ambiguity. Yep. He didn't have all the details. There was a lot of fog and a lot of haze to what was going to happen. But what's so important is that was just on the details. Mm. Philip was not foggy on his mission. His yep. mission was to go and be that harvest force for those harvest fields. He would go with the gospel he had and do what he knew to do that he had learned in the mentors and examples of his life. Mm. But he was a little foggy on the details. Sure. So 
as we see that model, yeah, there's going to be ambiguity, and that doesn't mean it's unbiblical or that doesn't mean it's errant, mm. right? We go with what we know, and we're trusting in the Lord, just as Philip, being very spirit-dependent along the way. Embrace that ambiguity. Yeah, I love that. That's a good way to say it. You know, another good aspect of Philip's story on the Gaza Road being a model for us in Acts 8 is that it was cross-cultural. Mm. Some people just really have a problem understanding that people from another culture going into a different one can actually be effective and impactful. And I love about this model is Philip was that harvest force being sent to a harvest field of a man from Ethiopia. They were culturally different. Yep. Their skin tone was different. Their language was different. Their approach to life was different. Their dietary restrictions were different. Their stage of life was different. Their occupation was different. Everything was cross-cultural in this encounter. And God said, that's the harvest force I want for this harvest field. Yep. So as we look for a model, a biblical model for short-term missions, we see, hey, Cross-cultural ones are used by God and can be very effective. Yeah. So don't let that discount us mm. in our model. There's a viability to the cross-cultural aspect. Of you it, betcha. Right? And it's very biblical. Mm -hmm. Another one I like to look at is that what we see in Peter's mo or Philip's model is it was focused on evangelism and initial discipleship. Mm. That's what he knew. That was the mission at hand. And I think to be, have a biblical model for short-term missions— we see that it is standing on a foundation of evangelism and initial disciple making. Mm. Uh, and if we have that in our model of short-term mission, we're going to be following in a good biblical model. And then there's three other ones that we can hit real quick that just show up in this model and would help us shape up, you know, a, a good biblical example and precedence to follow. It was incarnational, right? He was down in there with the people. It was brief. You know, a lot of the bad rap short-term missions gets us, what kind of difference can he make in five days, six days, a week, two weeks? You know, we have a lot of, some people that say to us, we don't want to go halfway around the world with fam and just stay for a week. Uh, you know, we, we have to stay for two to three weeks or we're not going. And I usually say, hey, brother, you're going to get a month's worth of ministry done in the four to five days you're going to be in the field. You're going to be gone eight days. You're going to be in the field four. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get a month's worth of ministry done. And usually, as you know, by the fourth day, they are ready to turn nose and come home. It's like, okay, I've had all I can yep. take, and we've made a huge impact. But even in this biblical model, we see Philip's time with the Ethiopian man was brief. Yeah. And that's a good part of the model when we're looking and to a biblical this, basis. Despite the briefness, it was worth it. And impactful. Yep. Yes, sir. And then the last one, it was very strategic. Mm. Um, when we look at a biblical model for short-term mission, it should not be flippant. It should not be uh, sporadic. It should not be just uh, kind of close your eyes, throw the dart at the dartboard, and hope something sticks. It mm. should be strategic. Yeah. Uh, our time is valuable. The people's time we're engaging with on the field is valuable. The resources being, expent, uh, being spent are valuable. So what we're doing there should be very strategic. Mm. We should be employing an aim to achieve the mission at hand and that is strategy. So in the way that we're pursuing it uh, as being that harvest force, strategic. The way we're incarnational presence with them, strategic. The way we're sharing the gospel, making disciples, strategic. And even in our brief window there, we should make the best of the time we have with a strategy, right, for our short-term mission. Yeah. A second example that we love to talk about here is is Paul in Acts 17, that, oh, yeah. that mission trip that he had. Yeah to Athens. Yeah, that's a great example. You know, I think it helps us to get the uh, proper mindset that's going to be necessary to really pursue a biblical short-term missions. Yeah, so what are some of those mindset principles that you see in this story? Yeah, you know, when we look at Paul on his short-term mission to Athens, um, we start to get an insight into his mindset. And there's so much we can learn as we prepare to be, okay, how can I be effective on the mission field short term? And how can I know I'm following in a good biblical process with mm -hmm. it? And when we look at Paul's mindset in the story, we see five things. And the first one we see is Paul, he was going, not neglecting the best while he was doing the good. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, there, there's a ton of things that we can do while we're while we're on a trip. Oh, uh, there's so many things, and a lot of them are are good things. But for for Paul, what we see here in this text is he was going and he was not neglecting the best thing, which is sharing the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. There were a lot of distractions he could have got involved in with everything that he was seeing, but he kept the main thing, the best thing, in focus and didn't get distracted with the good. Yeah. You know, someone once said, "The enemy of great." is good. And my old mentor, my university days would always say, you know, don't get caught spending your time on good while the best thing gets left undone. And what he was referring to is that first love, that best thing of sharing the gospel and introducing people into Christ. Man, there's a lot of stuff out there, but Paul's mindset was go, not neglecting the best while doing the good. Mm -hmm. Second mindset factor we see that creates a great uh, model for us is that Paul, was he, he said, go focus not on the negative, but stay focused on the positive. I mean, there was a lot of negative that Paul could have focused on. He could have had a righteous indignation that rose up as he walked among, among all those gods and yeah. idols and deities idols, yeah. there in Athens. But he said, you know what? There's a little window right there that I can be positive about. I can use that to create an open door to touch people's hearts. So he's saying, hey, go focused, you know, on the positive, not getting off into the negative. And, this is, and it's really easy for people oh, to do. Man. I mean, it's easy for me to do, to yeah. get caught up in those, the negative things, the things that take us, distract us or get on our nerves, whatever it is. Yeah. But we, we can focus our attention on those negative things. You but for, for Paul, he, he didn't even get sidelined. He was focused on the positive. You bet. That was a great mindset that he brought into this short-term mission. He also said, hey, go not as a cultural critic, but go as a cultural learner. That is a wonderful mindset we learn in Paul. I mean, he went in, he could have ripped them apart in their culture, in their polytheism, in their, you know, uh, crazy living and, and sexually immoral lifestyles and the, the type of food they ate and everything that set off all his triggers. Yeah. He could have just got so indignant in the whole situation. But his mindset was, let me be a cultural learner mm -hmm. here and not get into the lane of that critic. Yep. And that's where he tapped into some of their poetry and began to quote their poetry back to them as a cultural learner. Mm -hmm looking for inroads, looking for analogy, looking for bridges, instead of letting a critical mindset put up a lot of barriers and blocks yep. to people knowing Christ. Yeah, and this, I mean, it can it can make a trip or it can make a, a mission yeah. that much harder and it can make oh, it man. that much easier if yeah. you're going in with this with this mindset. And that's what it is. It's a mindset. You're, yeah. you're curious about these things rather than just coming in with an air of superiority. Uh, you're, you're setting yourself as a servant. Yeah, you betcha. That attitude right there, that particular part of mindset is a make it or break it on any short-term mission trip. Um, then he said, go, confronting sin, but loving the sinner. I mean, Paul could have went in, he could have just got after it and raked him over the coals. But with his mindset to keep the main thing, the main thing, mm -hmm. with being that cultural learner, he confronted sin. When you look at the message that he shares in Acts chapter 17, he confronted the sin that they found themselves in, but all the while loving the sinner. Yeah. And this is going to be crucial in our mentality as we approach a short-term mission because we're going to see people that are blatantly in sinful lifestyles that are obvious and upfront and offensive to us as followers of Jesus— and how do we confront that sin that separates them from God while realizing that they're the ones Jesus died for mm. that have yet to hear? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be an essential element of our mindset. Yeah. And, and we've already talked about we're not going in as a critic. We're not focusing on the negative. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we're just overlooking Absolutely all of the not. sin. We're calling it out. We're confronting it. But doing so with the mindset of and the posturing of loving the neighbor, loving the, neighbor, loving the yeah. sinner. Um, it's got to be there. You bet. So now Paul's going, you know, giving us insights into how to pursue short-term missions biblically with the proper mindset. And I want to end with this last one. He says, go expecting God to move. Hmm. 
when, when he was executing all these things, keeping the best thing up front, staying positive, being a cultural learner, hating sin but loving the sinner, confronting it and calling them to Christ, letting loving kindness, lead, God's loving kindness, lead people toward repentance. Yeah. But saying, you need to repent, he was expecting God to move. And I, I want to tell everybody that is planning on going on a trip with fam this year or next year, or you've ever been, or you're going with some other organization to do something, go expecting God to move. Man, when Paul shared that gospel, when he engaged that culture and community, he expected God to move. You say, really? Just after serving in that one day, in that one encounter? He's expecting God to move. Mm. And, you know, and when we look at the end of the story, we actually see, see God moved and the people responded in three ways. And I think we can kind of anticipate when we expect God to move. Yeah, he's going to move, but it may not be every, in every way we think he's going to move. Sure. And what Paul saw was the first thing is that some of the people, they just flat out rejected mm. it. Right. So we're expecting that. We go expecting that. Some people are going to reject. Yep. And then there was an expectation that some were going to seek out more. They're yeah. Going to want to know more. You bet. And that's where good strategy comes in. You know, we want to avoid bad missions. Sure. A lot of people are going to respond with, hey, I'm interested, but I need to hear more. I'm so far from the cross. This has brought me a step closer. I want to engage, mm -hmm. but I'm still wrestling, dealing with a lot of things. I have a lot of questions unanswered. And if our strategy is just, I showed up this day, I'm here, I'm out. It's your one shot. <laughs> yeah. That's bad missions. Yeah. But let's make sure we're piggybacking upon. And FAMS put some processes and systems that make sure we do that, anticipating God to move where people aren't ready to come across the goal line. So we have follow-up procedures, teams, story groups, churches there to be perpetuating the gospel presence and gospel proclamation, even after our short-term mm -hmm. leave-goers depart. Yep. But that's not the only way he's moving. All right. God's also moving in such a way, and we should expect it. Mm. That when we go, incarnation, when we go even brief, when we go as that learner, when we go confronting sin, but loving the sinner, proclaiming the gospel, doing evangelism, we should go expecting God to move and that some people will be right there ready to receive the Lord and accept him as their, as their God, their Savior, their one and only. Uh, so we should be expecting that. Not be shocked when that happens. Yeah, or unprepared on what to do about mm -hmm. it, right? We should be expecting people to say yes to this message that we've said yes to yeah. and know how to walk them through initial discipleship, how to bring them into a life-giving community, how to start exposing them to the greater body of Christ in an appropriate way. But man, if you're not expecting it, when God moves with either rejection or with acceptance, you're going to be on your heels. Yeah. And there's no carpe diem. There's no seizing the day <laughs> when you're not expecting God to move. Yep. Yeah. So we're answering the question, are short-term missions biblical? We see examples in Scripture. We see uh, principles of uh, you know helping us to pursue short-term missions biblically. Yep, we've seen Philip's model, and then we've seen Paul's mindset. Yeah, that's right. And there's one more that I want to bring out that's just a, a great example of the biblical basis for short-term mission, and that is Jesus' example. We've seen Philip's example. We've seen Paul's example. But Jesus' example mm. of how to measure success on a short-term mission, it is essential if we're going to be following uh, a biblical basis of doing short-term yeah. missions. When I think of mission, I think of Paul, I think of Peter, I think of Acts, you know, yeah. past Jesus' ascension. Um, but where do you see Jesus' mission, the, the model he gives, most clearly articulated? You bet. We see a great example of it in Luke chapter 10. I mean, this is a clear case where Jesus is sending his disciples on a short-term mission. Everything that we see in the model we talked about with Philip, all mm. those characteristics are here with these guys and the people that are going out on this one. Mm. So as Jesus is sending them out, he's also saying, hey, as you go in that short-term mission, I want you to know if you've been successful or not. And Jesus gives them a clear measurement, a measurement of Jesus standard, of a kingdom standard of mission success. Mm. So are you saying how we define success, a mission success, is determines whether a, a mission is biblical? That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, so how do we find define success? Yeah, you know, there's so many things that we do out there that we call missions, mm. and we're doing this as a mission. 
But when we look at this metric of success that Jesus put for there, it doesn't live up to any worldly standard. It has a very prescribed manner that that I like to really look at as it's Jesus' standard of measuring success. It's a kingdom-focused standard of measuring success on a mission trip. So any short-term mission we would go after, if we want it to be biblical, we should make sure that the end result of it matches that biblical example as well, that we're measuring our success in it by that Jesus kingdom standard. Now, to help with that, we have come up with a mission success yeah. checklist uh, to, to really determine whether um, you have been on a successful mission or not. Yeah, that's right. Obedient to uh, what, what this model has given us. Yeah, that checklist comes right out of Luke chapter 10. And we give it to everybody who's going to be going on one of our short-term missions before they go so they can be saying, okay, this is how I'm going to measure the success of the time and energy and effort I spent in that harvest field. And then after the mission is done, on the last day when we have our debrief, we go back through that checklist one by one and hit everyone to say, was I successful on my mission, not by my own standard, by some earthly, worldly standard? Was I successful by Jesus' kingdom standard Mm. of what a biblical short-term mission should be like? And, man, it's beautiful. It's helpful. It makes sure that when you get in that plane, you buckle up, and before you go wheels up, you're able to look back, and that sinking feeling never hits your heart. You know what I've done here mattered. It has made a difference, and I've lived up to a Jesus kingdom standard for success. And, Derek, I think— why don't you just walk through that checklist? I want our listeners to get to hear this because it's beautiful, man, what, what God can do if someone were to really measure their success on a short-term mission by a standard, a checklist like this. Yeah, so we, we really just walk through that, that passage in Luke 10 and, yeah. and look at how did he define it. So uh, this checklist comes down to six questions, yeah. and that's what we, we ask all of our goers to, to answer as they're coming back from the trip. Look at it beforehand, but answer on your way back. The first one, did you accept the appointment and go? Yeah, check. Did you remain dependent upon God for all your needs Mm. and outcomes? Now, the cool thing about that question is nobody can answer that except you. Mm. The pastor can't answer it for you, the trip leader, the missionary on the field. Only you can really answer that qualitative expression of mission success. Yep. And then the third one, did you put yourself in a direct position to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the unreached? Yeah. Did you hide out? Did you wimp out? Did you cop out? Did you pass the ball to somebody else when the Lord wanted it in your hands? Mm -hmm. Only you'll be able to answer that question. The fourth one, did you share the gospel of the kingdom with them? Yeah. In the midst of all the other things we were doing and the social works we were doing, the helps, the cares, did we actually communicate the gospel of the kingdom really the only thing that can make an eternal difference in these people's life and the thing that they're most desperate for. Yeah. Did we keep the main thing the main thing? You're going to be able to say yes or no. Check mm. that box off. And the fifth one, did you return with joy focused on the main thing? Mm, I love that. You know, sometimes we return with guilt. Sometimes we kind of return with a little bit of shame by the standard of living we have opposed to the people we served and Sometimes we just leave with a little bit of depression knowing that my life this week doesn't match the life I lived the other 51 weeks of the year. And uh, there's a little bit of depression that comes in with that. But to be able to leave that mission saying, I'm leaving here filled with joy because of my obedience, and it lasts even when I get back, that's a whole other style of metric to judge our success by. Yeah. And then the, the last one is, did you— caused Jesus to be filled with joy because of your obedience. Again, it's a question only you can answer. Is his spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God and you have been pleasing to your heavenly father through what you've done in this opportunity of a short-term mission? Man, when you were walking those aspects of this measurement down, this kingdom-focused mission checklist— what I kept thinking about was the questions that aren't there. I mean, you just think mm. about them. It's not, what was your numbers? You know, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't there. How many people signed the dotted line? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, how many pounds of food did you give out? It, it was nothing about just this qualitative numbers game, 
Man, we see tons of people coming to Christ on our short-term trips. We see a lot of energy and high points, and we track them, and we're understanding and knowledgeable. That, man, we celebrate them. Yeah. But on a personal level, for you being successful in a mission metric, it's looking at these more qualitative answers, right, mm. and questions than just looking how many people came, how much stuff did we do? How many people did we get to fill out a card or something like that? Sure. Hey, we're calling people to Christ, and we're understanding that. We're tracking that. Mm. Um, but when it comes down to how successful was I really, in Jesus' understanding, there's a whole different standard mm. on whether my mission was successful or not. And for all of our pastors that are listening, our missions pastors, our potential goers, and those people that go with FAM every year— Man, can you imagine, can you imagine what a checklist like this would do in the life of your people when they realize that there's a whole other standard for what mission success means than what we've perceived in the past, yeah. than other measurements that we've given that have left us wanting, left us a bit hollow, mm. sometimes left us a little bit embarrassed, and have left us getting on a plane or on a bus, closing the door and buckling up, and having that nagging, sinking feeling in our gut. What did I actually accomplish here? Man, fam, we have went through great lengths to make sure that that is not happening with people that go mm -hmm. on our trip, that we are not perpetuating bad missions, that we're putting together a short-term experience because we believe they're biblical. We have a model we can follow. There's a mindset that we're in. We want everybody to have that goes. And we're going to judge the success of it, not by our own standard, but by Jesus and a kingdom standard to really see what our window and picture of success looks like. I love the way FAM does short-term missions. I thank God for this biblical basis that He's given us. And I want to say thank you to the thousands of people that have been on short-term missions with FAM over the last 14 years. And I'm excited about the potential of you who are planning to go with us in our partnerships in the years to come for the impact you can make on the field and the impact that it's going to make on you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Don't miss part two as we keep talking about FAM's short-term missions focused on the harvest fields and what it means to be part of that harvest force. Now, go and live dangerous for Jesus. <laughs>